Good morning, church. Well, it's a beautiful day outside. It's a beautiful day. I love today because it's another day that the Lord has given us. So I want to welcome you all, whether you're here in person or if you're joining us online. Thank you for being with us today. Today is National Back to Church Sunday, and we are so glad to have you all with us. Um, for those of you that got to enjoy the movie last night, we had, uh, well, you know, with COVID out, it was pretty impressive to have a couple dozen people here to watch an amazing movie that um, I think everybody at least had to wipe their nose on their sleeve or use a Kleenex or get it stuck in their mask and take it home and wash it. But um, over the next five weeks, starting today, We'll be doing a sermon series based on that movie. And it, if you didn't get a chance to see the movie, and I know it's already being lent out to, to, uh, to someone to, uh, today after service, so, um, but if you didn't get a chance, let us know. We'd be happy to lend you the DVD so that you can watch this movie. It is incredible, and it will help you really uh, get a grasp on, on what's happening over the next five weeks. Now, um, with that, Let's, uh, let's go to our call to worship this morning. A little out of breath, trying to get used to this thing and, and moving around and not doing things. So we'll see how this works out for me. Our call to worship this morning comes from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. And before I even read it, the first thing, is, I think of music. When I hear things, I think of music. Now, I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but I do like music. And the first song that I think of comes from a group. Uh, I know them by Audio A. Uh, some of you may know them as Audio Adrenaline. But they are an amazing group. Um, and uh, they're no longer together, actually, because their lead singer, he lost his voice. But through, and we talked about perseverance last week and resilience last week, Pastor Mark taught us. He, through that, has come through with his faith intact, which is really a lot about what this series is going to be about. And, and the song that they sing is called Big House. And I, I remember, you know, with the youth group that I was, had at one point, uh, they, they did the, uh, the hand motions. And I'm, I, I feel restricted here because I can't do it because they say it's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. A big, big table with lots and lots of food. Jesus has gone ahead to prepare for us. And listen to what he says here. He says, in, in, starting at verse 1, he says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I'm going. Now, as I read this, I'm thinking, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus came. He, he left his, his earthly home, or his heavenly home, excuse me, to come to his earthly home. He left his, he, I mean, we've had discussions about this, especially back on Trinity Sunday, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So he is, I mean, three in one God, right? So he left that. He gave that up. And he came here. And he lived a sinless life first. And he, he went through times where it was trouble. I mean, think about when he was in the garden and he's going, not my will, God, but yours. Not mine, but yours. So he went through those same troubles. So he understands it. So when he says, don't let your hearts be troubled, he knows exactly what he's telling us. But, and he's also saying there's more than enough room. There's plenty of room in heaven for everyone. But as, as we were watching, we were watching a, a, a documentary last night about Lee Strobel, and, and he was talking about um, how we can lose our faith. And where there is only one way to heaven. It's, it's not a prideful thing for us. 
It's not us saying that we're better than everyone else. It's just fact. No other religion has a way, loving way to God, a God that cares about them, that, that loves them and wants them to be with him. So there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And there's plenty of room. So no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what you're going through, how hard it is right here on earth, because let's face it, things can be difficult. I was told last night that I needed to delegate when we were cleaning up and not do. It's hard for me not to do. So those are the things we have here. There's worse things. I mean, people are sick. People die. People have short lives. People have long lives. People are poor. People are rich. There's, there's this whole gamut. But what are, none of that matters in the end. Because when... When our life ends here, then eternity begins. And I'm not going to even try to remember because I always flub it up with what Mark would normally say about that. But it, the gist of it is, is when our life ends here, eternity begins. And where does that eternity begin? Where is that going to be? Let's make it this big, big house that's been prepared for us. Because there's a ton of room. There's a big table. I'm sure there's going to be football. At least that's what the song says. And I'm excited for that. So, Father God, it is in you that we find our hope. It is in you that we know that we have an eternity in heaven. We are too often, Father, we, we, we don't want to say that word, that word that, that strikes fear in some people's minds, hell. We don't want to spend eternity there, Father. That's not where we want to be. We want to spend it with you. We want to spend it in your glory. We know that Jesus came. We know that he, was, he went through all the things that we did, but yet we did it without sin. Father, let that be our guide in how we live our lives. And no matter what we do here on earth, Once we have that relationship with your son, Father, we know that you through the Holy Spirit will change us, Father. So come, Father. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Change us. Help us prepare for our eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you much, Pastor Terry. Uh, we had an opportunity last night to see hope in action. We, we had the opportunity last night to see love in action. But moreover, throughout the whole movie that we saw last night, we got to see faith in action. And those are some of the greatest tenets that we have within our faith. And if we think about it, and, and Pastor Terry is talking about that, I, I was playing the movie last night before our other movie started, um, A Case for Faith by Lee Strobel. And it was talking about how one of the greatest evangelists there was had lost his faith, had lost his way. And, you know, we, we have to think about that. We have to think of... If we allow the outside world to dictate our faith, we will lose it. If we lose our sight in Jesus, if we lose our sight on God, and we no longer can base our faith upon those promises, then we're bound to lose our faith. We're bound to lose our way on the path. It doesn't mean we can't come back and get back on the right path. And if you've ever seen that, that uh, poem about footsteps, and it's all about people who have lost their way and they've lost their path, and they think that God has abandoned them. And he says, no, 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 no. Look at all these times in your lives, and you look and there's only one set of footprints here. But that's when I was carrying you. God is faithful, God is just. God makes promises, and he always keeps his promises. So we started off today with the call to worship, 
in John 14, one through four, and it starts off, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There is enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? See, and that's a promise. That's a promise that we can base our faith upon. But he doesn't leave it alone there. He says, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you will know the way where I am going. So he goes beyond that promise and he says, hey, here's where your faith comes in. When you are ready, I'm going to come and get you so that you can be with me in eternity. Life ends eternity where? And that's kind of what Terry was, was searching for earlier this morning, but <laughs> he gives me a thumbs up, kind of. Okay. Uh, but it's true. Life ends eternity where? Where are we going to spend eternity? And here we have a promise from Jesus and he tells us that you know, if you are faithful, then you will come and be with me, and I will prepare a place for you. So today we're going to kind of uh, take a look at it, and if you've got your Bibles with you today, or if you want to open up your electronic Bible and go into Romans 8, we're going to start off with Romans 8:18, 8, and I, I want you to listen through the passage first before you try and open your Bible and read it. But it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Now, sometimes you read a scripture and you're just going, boom, the light bulb turns on, and other times you're kind of going, wow, I got to ponder on this one for a while. And this is kind of the one that you got to ponder on for a little bit. Because you're saying, okay, Paul, what are you trying to say here? And so, you know, it's kind of, how do we put our trust in things? How do we take a look at things? You know, the present things that we're going through in our life, those problems, those challenges, and we had 2020 has just been full to the brim with challenges. And it just seems like we're just starting to creep up and get to that precipice so we kind of head down on the other, and oops, nope, sorry, that was just a little plateau. Now we got another challenge that's gonna hit us again. And that's kind of what 2020's been for us. But, you know, that's great because we have promises those of us who are faithful, those who are of us who are believers in the word of God, we've got these promises that no matter what our present sufferings are, he's got a better deal for us waiting for us. And that's what this means. That's what Paul is giving to the people that he's talking about, the Roman congregation that they had, the Roman church back in those days. So if you've ever heard of the name Robert Ripley, anybody know who that guy is? Robert Ripley? Well, if you know the name, then you'll know that he kind of made a, a fortune off this phrase, and it's called Believe It or Not. So you have Ripley's Believe It or Not out there. He's got kind of theme places that you can go and take the family, and he, he had a traveling show at one point in time. He had TV shows back in the, that started all the way back in 1949, and that, believe it or not, was the phrase that had four more sets of TV shows. It was so popular that once the TV show ended, they'd bring it back again, and they brought it back again, and they brought it back another time. And the whole premise was based on, you know, weird stories and bizarre events and items that seemed so strange that you'd have to question what you're seeing or what you're hearing. And so 
What's fascinating about it was that here's a man, Robert Ripley, that built an entire empire based on you questioning whether you believe something or not. Whether you believe something or not. And so he made that entire empire on challenging people's beliefs. And so when you're watching the show, it'd, it'd go through absolutely unbelievable scenarios and it would always end up with that one phrase, believe it or not. So when it seemed almost absolutely unbelievable, Ripley would challenge viewers to press in and still believe. When it became unbelievable, he press, had that people just holding on and saying, do you believe it? Can you believe it? And he challenged people to think outside of what they would normally see. Last night we heard in the movie, you know, as, as Melissa was dying of cancer in the movie, and she quoted scripture, and she quoted a scripture that talked about walk by faith not by sight. Don't let your eyes deceive you, but let your faith guide you. Paul's message to the Romans in here is talking about that same thing. Don't let your present sufferings control what you believe. Don't let it control your faith. So Robert Ripley says what might be easy for one police person to believe may be hard for another to believe. And he built this whole empire based on that. Because our circumstances often shape our beliefs. And often those circumstances can shape our belief in one of two major ways. Either it will shape it for distrust, or it'll shape it towards faith. See, here comes that free will choice that God gives us. We can trust in what we see or distrust what we see. But if we have faith, it will guide us through to the correct answer. So for the next five weeks, we're going to talk about how our circumstances in our lives shape our view of God. And this sermon is called, I Still Believe, and it's based on the film that we saw that last night. And, and that captures the various circumstances that Christian singer Jeremy Camp found himself facing. And it threatened his belief and his understanding of I had the opportunity to talk to somebody after the movie last night who's living this out right now. He's got circumstances in his life that are causing him to turn away from God, to challenge what he built, had his life built on. His faith is being challenged. And he's struggling. He's really struggling, and he's mad at God. We'll talk about that more in a little while. So we chose to, co to camp out in Romans 8 today because many times if we are struggling, if we feel uncertain, if we're all dealing with some kind of personal challenge that's affecting us in there, which we all do and we all are, at any certain time in our life, we're, we're all going to face challenges. And one of the best places that we can turn is to turn to that chapter, that eighth chapter of Romans. So in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul was writing to that group of Christians who had yet to experience persecution as it had in many of the other churches in the area. The church of Rome was not being persecuted at this point in time when his letter to the Romans were written, but it soon would be. And so he was kind of trying to prepare them in advance and the hypothetical situations that 
that he was posing in the letter to the Roman church would soon become painful realities for them as the persecutions started. And the question underneath all of this in the verse that Paul wants them to answer is, where is your hope? Where is your hope? When your present circumstances seem to be overwhelming to you, where is your hope? Where is your hope? So last week I mentioned that at times it seems as though hope took the last train to Boston. Because sometimes we just feel like we're emptied out. There is no hope left to have. Our faith is hitting rock bottom. We're hitting a dry zone. And don't feel bad. Everybody has a dry spell. Everybody has a dry spell. No matter who you are. It's hard not to. But see, that's why God gave us these promises that we can stand on. To help us hold strong in those dry periods. In those dry spells that we have our life. So where is your hope? So I also said last week that we put our trust and belief in us either in fear or faith. See, and oftentimes the circumstance seems so overwhelming that we tend to blame God for the poor choices that we've made in our lives, which then lead to the challenges that we're facing. Most of them are made by our own choices. So we end up holding that pity party I talked about last week for ourselves, and we end up losing ourselves in the process. So we begin down that path of distrust and ask, how could a living God allow this to happen to me? Who in this room has not asked that question at least once in their lives? I have. I have. Because see, that circumstance seemed to be overwhelming and I was walking by sight and not by faith. And that's the key. That's absolutely the key. So we walk by sight and not by faith. And so God gives us these promises and he gives us these words. And they're more than just empty platitudes. They're there to lift us up. They're there to tell us ahead of time, to give us that forewarning. Hey. You're going to have a challenge. The good news is, don't walk by sight. Don't look at those things. Walk by faith and not by sight. Don't lose track of who I am and what I can do for you. See, and that's exactly what we need to understand, that God did not make those choices for us that got us into those situations. He gave us free will so that we could make those bad decisions on our own. Free will so we could make the bad decisions on our own. And the thing about it is, is I want you to ask yourselves when you got into those troubles, when you got into those situations that were overwhelming and where you were starting to lose that basis of faith, I have a question to ask yourself. Did you go to God first and ask for guidance? Or did you rely on your own judgment to make that choice. Ooh, that one kind of stings, doesn't it? Did you go to God first and say, hey God, can you guide me through on what I should do here? Or did you rely on yourself? See, we opened up with those words from John 14, 1 this morning, and Jesus said to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also me. In other words, what we're saying here is don't let fear rule your heart. Trust in God gives us that basis of faith that gives us hope. And I've said before, fear and faith cannot occupy the same place at the same time. So I ask you this morning, just as Paul was asking that Roman church, where is your See, and that's one of, probably one of the fundamentally important questions that you're going to have to answer in your life. Where is your hope? 
because where you put your hope determines so much on the trajectory of where your life is going to go. We focus on that. That helps us make our choices. And either we can make choices blindly and rely upon ourselves, or we can put our trust in God. You can either rise up by your choices or you can fall down. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like you to open those up to Romans 8.18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And the NIV is how it puts it. And here Paul is talking to us about putting our hope in the right thing. And it begins by saying, I consider that our present sufferings. Present sufferings. So what Paul here does is he uses that general description to describe something that's very, very personal to us. See, my personal sufferings are different from your personal sufferings who are different from yours. So they're very personal to us. And so Paul uses this broad term, kind of a painting with a broad brush, if you will. But see, for each one of us, there's going to be a personal connection to that suffering. There's a personal emotion attached to it because we have it. We all have it. And everywhere you look, we see it. You might hear it when you walk through your neighborhood and you hear a husband yelling at his wife. Or it's the neighbor across the street who has given a foreclosure notice. Or it's a co-worker that's struggling on so many fronts they can't see a way out. And who's really struggling with a depression because of it. Or it's the lady at the grocery store. A single mom who is barely making ends meet and she gets all the way up to the checkout line and she sees that she doesn't have enough money to pay for the groceries she just got done picking up. Maybe it's that student down the hall who's battling with an eating disorder. See, I've witnessed many of these experiences just this past week myself. Each one of us, as we go through life, we get opportunities to see the realities of someone's personal suffering. Because to them it's a reality. And to us, we may just be passing it by. But for them, it's personal. It's personal. See, and our calling from God is that even though it's someone else and it's their personal struggle, we're still called by God to reach out to them in the midst of their storm, in the midst of their struggle, and reach out a hand. Now, it may not be a physical hand. Reach out to them in prayer. There's so many ways that we can lift them up, that we can hold them, that we can steady them in their storm. And maybe talking to them outside after the movie. And helping them change their perspective and giving them a change of heart and showing them that by the things that God has done in their lives, that the things that they're very struggling through, he used already in their life to help someone else out. No matter what we do, no matter the struggle that we face, the challenge that we face, God will use it for good. We have to have our eyes open, our hearts open, our minds open to understand that we can be a blessing to someone else in the middle of their storm. And someone else can be a blessing to us in the middle of ours. We have to allow ourselves to be open to someone else helping us out in the middle of our storms. So here's the deal, present suffering. That's something that all of us, all of us suffer with. 
And it's important for us to recognize how Scripture deals with it because many times we can give the false impression that if you just become a Christian, your life is all going to be laid out for you. Everything's going to be grand. Everything's going to be great. So I, I got a challenge for you. You got your Bibles in front of you today. I want you to go through and find me the first scripture that says, once you become a Christian, everything's going to be grand. No more troubles. No more suffering. No more challenges in life. I can kind of save you the time. There isn't one. It doesn't exist. But in fact, if you go in there, it actually says, oops, guess what? It says in there, uh, you're going to have present sufferings. It calls it out. In John 16, Jesus says in this world, you will have trouble. Hmm. So just because you became a Christian, don't believe that there's not going to be any present sufferings. God is going to take care of all the little things. There aren't going to be any of those big challenges and struggles anymore. When somebody becomes a Christian, suddenly they deal with that present suffering. They say, hey, time out. Wait a minute. What's going on? This isn't the way it's supposed to be. I thought if I'm on God's team that he's going to take care of everything in the world for me. That doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. In this world, there's going to be these present sufferings, and there's going to be challenges for us as Christians. And our challenge is to remember that our hope is in heaven and to live with that reality in mind. Our hope is in heaven, and that is the reality that we need to live in. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. Don't let us become blinded to the challenges that we have in our life. Blinded to the promises that God has got for us. Blinded to the things that God has already prepared for us. Blinded to the blessings that he gives us each and every day of our lives. See, we need to do just the opposite and have our eyes opened up. We need to recognize those blessings that he lays out before us. Those people who are blessings in our lives. Those people who are struggling themselves and yet they become a blessing to us. We saw it this morning. Hey, I brought you a lunch because I know you're going through a lot right now. God's blessings, put it upon our heart to be a blessing to another person in the midst of their storm, in the midst of their struggles. That's what being a Christian is all about. So let's read that full verse from Romans 8.18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And so here Paul is saying, here's what I want you to do. You've got your present suffering that we've already identified. You've kind of circled that in your head and in your heart. And he says at that point in time, I don't consider a present suffering even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. It's not even worth comparing. So what I want you to do is I want you to hold on to that thought for a few moments here. Hold on to that thought. It's not even worth comparing. No matter what we're going through right now, no matter how overwhelming it seems to be, it's not even worth comparing to the future that Christ has for us. That promise of hope that Christ has for us. So Lee Strobel gives us an example that helps us illustrate what Paul is saying in the verse. And he says, imagine that this is the first day of the year and it was the worst day ever. You had a root canal on January 1st. You went in for the root canal and the anesthesia wore off halfway through the root canal. And then you got in the car and you were driving home and you were in a lot of pain, a little bit delirious and distracted. 
So you got in a car accident. It totaled the car. You got out of the car and you're okay. But it's obvious that the car you ran into is also totaled. Oh, and by the way, here's the kicker. It's your wife's car or your spouse and your husband's car. So now both your cars are gone. You finally make it home. You got home and there was a foreclosure notice on your front door. And while you're reading the foreclosure notice, you got this text that says, your boss is telling you not to come in the next day because your position has been terminated. So you've lost teeth, cars, your house, and your job. It was just the worst day. The worst day ever. But then, and I need you to imagine this one here. Let's just imagine that January 2nd, things got better. And they started to look up. You open up your email feeling pretty discouraged and down about January 1st, only to see in your email that you had a rich uncle that passed away and he left you $42 million. So you go out and you buy the car of your dreams and a few months later, you have your dream house built. And you didn't even know that he lived around here, but it turns out that Michael Jordan is your next door neighbor. He's always coming over. He just, come on over and shoot some baskets with me, will you? And then you start this company and you're not even sure what you're gonna do with the company, but turns out, guess what? You found the cure to cancer. And then there's this Tahitian island that comes up for sale and you buy this Tahitian island. So it's just this absolutely incredible, incredible year. Everything was going your way. And on the last day of that year, one of your friends comes and says, hey, how's that year gone for you? And you say, oh yeah, yeah. You wanna visit me in Tahiti? Got my own island. You wanna come shoot baskets with me and Mike? I, I call him Mike, my next door neighbor. You might know him, Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah, it's a good year. It's a good year. It's been an incredible year. Absolutely incredible year. And your friend says, well, geez, that's pretty good here. Because I, I kind of remember looking on your Facebook page. And on your Facebook page, you, you told how bad January 1st was and what a horrible, horrible year you were having. And then you remember and you think, you know what? You're right. I hadn't even thought about that. I'd forgotten about that. That was really a tough day, a really rough day. But I mean, when I compare it to the rest of the year, it's not even worth comparing. Huh. Neat perspective, huh? That's the perspective that heaven gives us. It's not to say that this life's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that we're not going to go through challenges. It doesn't mean that our faith isn't going to be tested to the limits. But it means that even in our present suffering, it's not even worth comparing compared to what Jesus has got for us. Because he's gone and he's prepared a place for us. We get to spend eternity with him. And that should be enough to bolster your faith. To bring you back home in your head. To change your perspective. Things aren't really as bad when we had all these great things happen to us. Hey, I really forgot about that day. It's not really worth mentioning. So it may be difficult, but when, up, when you're up in heaven, it's then, oh, let's say, 552,323,000 years, and someone comes up and says, hey, how's your existence been so far? You're going to say, it's been incredible. It's been wonderful. There's no mourning. There's no pain. There's no sickness. There's no tears here. It's been incredible. You might say, well, I kind of remember hearing something about you on earth, and 
it was kind of tough on you. You had a hard time down there. And you remember back and you're like, you know what? Yeah. Now that you say that, I do remember that first 72 years or so were kind of difficult. But you know, when I really compare it to what I've experienced in heaven, well, it's not even worth comparing. I don't even think about it. It's not even worth comparing. And that's what Paul is saying to the Roman church in those days is, I don't see that our present sufferings, they're even worth comparing to the glory that will one day be ours in heaven through Jesus Christ. Life ends eternity. Where? Life ends eternity. Where? What you have put your hope in is what you will live for. So I asked you early on in the message today, where is your hope found? Where is your hope found? Where do you put your hope? Where do you put your hope? There's three things that are gonna determine where our hope lies. Number one is where you place your hope determines your ability to, be, to endure or persevere. And we talked about perseverance and persistence last week. And if you put your hope in something temporary, something that can be and will be eventually stripped away from you, then the challenges of life can lead to despair, discontent, and fear. But if you put your hope in something outside of this life, then it gives you the ability to endure and persist in the face of that challenge. It gives you a strength that you never knew you had, a strength that is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Romans 8, 11. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. Sounds like a song, huh, Terry? Yeah. The challenges that many of us face is we end up putting our hope in something that's going to be stripped away. It's just going to happen. That happens to all of us. Every one of us. And at that point in time, it causes us then to question our faith. And we need to turn back to that John, that verse in John that says, put your trust in me. Trust in God. Put your trust in So Paul talks about, to us in these passages about having a living hope. A hope that doesn't die in this war of circumstances that we face every day in life. The second thing that determined where our hope lies is where your hope lies determines how you engage in this world. And if we go into Romans 8, 19 through 21, it says, For the creation awaits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who just subjected it, in hope that the creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay, brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go back and I want you to reread that a couple of different times. So throughout the next week, I want you to go back and reread that passage. And I want you to see how it speaks to you differently each time you read it. It's the same words, but it will speak to you a little bit differently because God will continue to reveal its meaning to us as we study his word. And what this passage is telling us is that it's all about us. It's all around us. Creation waits well for us. You've been around children who wait well and children who don't wait well. The ones who wait well trust in their parents and their provider's promise, but the ones who don't wreak havoc throughout the home. They scream and flail and kick and cry as they wait. Yeah, got to experience that a couple times this week too especially when it came checkout time and there was a sea of candy and pop and all kinds of stuff. And this little probably two or three year old was just going, ah, 
I want it. And mom and dad are going, no, you don't. I don't want you to have it. So those who wait, those who wait, have to wait with an expectancy. And that expectancy is to trust in the promises of God. So what happens when we don't wait well? Well, it kind of leads to despair because ultimately we put our hope into something temporary. Temporary. When you're suffering or in pain, the hardest thing to do is wait. When dad was going through all the pain and everything and they hadn't given him any pain medication yesterday and he was squirming and I knew the kind of pain he was in because I've, I've had kidney stones before and it's just horrible. Horribly painful, horribly painful. And he was in tears and he was writhing in pain. It's hard to wait when we're suffering. It's hard to wait when we're in pain. You ever been in an emergency room waiting for your turn to see the doctor? Yeah, and you're in pain. And it's an eternity before they come to get you, or so it seems at the time. What if you're in that parking lot or a big stadium after a huge event, and you gotta wait for your turn to pull in line to get out of the lot? It's a hard thing to do. The Bible says when we suffer, we're gonna go through tough times. One of the things we need to do is learn how to wait well, wait expectantly. The word in Greek literally means to scan the horizon, straining every nerve in your neck, trying to see the dawn break, trying to see that there's a light in the darkness. Because that dawn comes after the dark. And every morning we have a dawn that comes from the dark. The light pierces the darkness and the darkness dissipates. I'd like you to hold on to that visual image in your head. Next time you're having problems, remember that the dawn comes. This too shall pass, the scripture says. This too shall pass. It's only for a season. When we go through tough times, we want to embrace hope through waiting well. So, in many ways, what we learn to put our hope in determines how we engage each day in circumstance. It lays a foundation for our temperament, our attitude. We talked about that last week. Day in and day out, that attitude and the way we approach whatever comes our way determines what our hope is going to be. Our third thing that we have and what determines our hope is where you place your hope determines what you will sacrifice for. Where we put our hope dictates what we will sacrifice everything for. What we will give our time to, what we will give our work to, our efforts to, what we will give our attention to, our days and hours to. And it's really that tough and it's really that simple at the same time. So what you do your sacrifices what do they reveal about your hope? What is your time going to? What fills up your screens on your phones and on your computers? What does the bulk of your money go to? How are you using the talents and the gifts that God has given you? So if we turn to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says... And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to read that to you one more time. And I want you to let it really, really sink in. Hebrews 1, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. 
fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning it shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, the writer of Hebrews reiterates what Paul had been talking about to the Romans. It's this call to persevere through our present sufferings. And we talked about that in last week's message about perseverance and resilience. How we can bounce back no matter what the suffering is, no matter what the trial is. And it's this call to persevere through our present sufferings. Not by having our difficult circumstances fixed. Not by having our circumstances fixed but fixing our eyes upon Jesus. I love the phrase that was left, that they had to hear. It is, for the joy set before him. Notice that phrase that immediately follows. He endured the cross. For Jesus, the joy was worth the sacrifice. The joy set before him was no match for the circumstance that surrounded him at that time. The joy was he got to go up and sit at the right hand of God. But to do that, he had to endure the cross. He had to persevere through the biggest challenge of his life. He had to give his life for us. For us. But the joy that he looked forward to was being reunited with God the Father in heaven and sitting at his right hand. Life ends eternity. Where? Think about that one. See, and it was that joy that was set before him that gave that sacrifice, that incredible purpose, the tool by which God would bring us into that joy. That bridged the gap for us. That sacrifice was our way to heaven. It was a promise by God that he made through his son Jesus that we would spend eternity with him if we believed in him. John 3.16 and it was done out of love, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son that whomsoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. He went and prepared a place for us so that we could share in that eternal joy. And it was done out of love, love, hope. They're all intertwined together. They're all intertwined together. I just wonder what God might be asking you to sacrifice for the joy set before you. What might God be asking you to engage in, even though it's going to cost you something? Even though it's going to cost you something. And I'm not talking money here. we got to get past the cost of money. What's it going to cost you? What present sufferings might God be inviting you to endure for the sake of not growing in despair, but growing in dependence, dependence upon him? Stop relying on ourselves. Go to God first and ask him, how do I attack this situation that I'm in? We go to God and we ask for guidance first. That's what faith is all about. We trust God. Trust God, but trust also in me, Jesus said. These are the kind of eyes we want to have in the midst of a hopeless world. Eyes to see the present sufferings as not worth comparing. Eyes to see sacrifices as opportunities and eyes to see a hope so unshakable that you can't help but live unleashed. Have that faith that 
just explodes into the world, into the circumstances. So for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about how to still believe when circumstances call for something other. That's something other. But it all starts here in these four verses. It all starts with the reality that God must be where we place our hope. Because where we place our hope determines by whose strength we will endure. By whose strength we will endure it. It determines how we will engage in this life. And it determines what we will sacrifice for true life. For eternal life. Today, I want to ask yourself here this simple question. How is God using my present suffering to help someone else? To give them hope when they've run dry. How is God using my present suffering to help someone else? Today, I pray that if you're hearing the sound of my voice and that you put in your hope in the things other than God, during this season in your life, that you would place your hope back in Jesus. Put your hope back in Jesus. Renew your faith. Trust in God. That you would make Jesus the Lord of your life. My prayer is that you would be able to say with confidence and faith, you are my hope to whatever you are facing. And to whatever face may come to be. Let us pray. Lord God, your, your love, your grace, and your mercy is big enough to surround this entire world. And I am just a small fragment within that world, Lord. Lord, you're bigger than any problem we can ever face. And Lord, we stand upon your promises today to live in faith, not by sight, not by the circumstances that overwhelm us, that tend to control us, Lord, but let us come to you first. Let us ask for your guidance through any problem, through any situation that we might face. Let us face that situation in faith not in fear. Lord, help us to see that there is a dawn coming up out of the darkness. Your light shining in the darkness for us to see. To give us hope. To help us in faith and understanding. In your holy name we pray today. Thank you so much, Mark. After watching the movie last night and listening to the sermon this morning, I was taken back many years to a time where I sat on my living room floor, leaned up against the couch, saying, why, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? I had my pity party. And over time, I've looked back on those times. And, you know, at the time, you say, like, well, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? And, and did the things that I want out of life happen? Did you hear what I said? The things that I want out of life. Did those happen? No. But did the things that God had for me, the, the, the things that I should have had hope in to begin with, are those the things that happened? I have a, a, a beautiful wife of nearly 20 years now. I have three amazing daughters, two wonderful grandsons, three grandkids, and a God that loves me more than I deserve. That's where my hope. You know, we, we saw in the movie last night, um, Gary Sinise, who plays Jeremy's father in the movie, Jeremy was basically asking him, how could you get through all this all these disappointments in your life. And he said, my life isn't, isn't not full because of the disappointments. It is 
full because of the experiences that I've had. My life is full because of the experiences that I've had. And it's not that when you said money, I'm like, I'm right with you there, Mark, because it's not about money. It's not about anything. It is about our eternity. And, you know, the beauty of it is, is that Christ came and died on the cross just for us. So it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then a little later in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood shed for your sin. Take and drink. And the scriptures tell us as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup that we are to do so until he returns. It also tells us that he will not have this meal until he returns. We have a father in heaven who loves us, who sent his son to die on the cross so that we could have communion with him. If you would like to take communion with us each Sunday, whether you, if you can't be with us here in person, let us know. We'll deliver these cups to you so that you can partake with communion with us. The body. Father, thank you for what this meal represents. Father, it is a meal that represents hope. And it's through your son that we have hope that no matter what happens here, no matter what we go through here, that when life ends, eternity is with you. Father, let us see the beauty of the life that you have set before us, all the trials and tribulations included because they have all forged us into the people that we have become. Let us be your light shining in this dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. physician. You are the great healer. We run to you in times of trouble. We ask for your forgiveness always. Oh, we just know that you love us so much, that you give us hope for a future. Even through times of trouble, you are always with us by our side, Lord Jesus. You are the great comforter in our hearts. So be with all of these people that we have lifted up in prayer, Lord Jesus. Comfort them today. Guide them. Give them hope and give them peace in their hearts today. Help them to know that you are with them. Because you love us, you died on the cross to save us from our sins and from our illnesses, Lord Jesus. So by your stripes, we are healed. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. This concludes our on-air portion of our service today. We invite you to come and join us in person if you're able. Uh, we know that some of you have 
issues that would allow you to come out in public, but uh, if you're able to join us, we would love to have you. Thank you and have a blessed week.